I didn't talk about it that much, but that's where I have to challenge myself. I can get into an um, argument based on Christ and get off it so quickly, super fast, to make it about me. I've done it. I've even had my kids call me out on it. More than once. Who has the first question, I should say? Oh, yeah, by the way. Yeah, by the, by the way. Yes. Considering what you've just spoken about, how does one handle that delicate tension between making it about God and, and when you see someone who's acting against God? And um, like Timothy, when he stood in front of that grave and died, it was just him. But like families with children. We are reaching that point where standing against those who hate God has put us in danger. And I mean, you look in the past and you look at the families who started homeschooling, like in the 60s and 70s, and risk having their children taken away to do the right thing. And then, like, you, you look at things now, and if you stand against injustice, then you risk your family's safety for that. Like, how do you handle that delicate balance between opposing those who hate God and yet caring for your children's safety at the same time? Because it is a very delicate balance. You, you don't want to like try to be so safe that you... Uh, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, I think you're talking about those who threaten to call... Uh, yeah. Um, there's a few things about that. First of all, as, as we've talked about before, um, what Liz is talking about, though, is, is some people that threatened to call children youth services because Liz, had, Liz was out with her children in a um, abolishing an abortion protest. Of course, we talked about that a little bit and mentioned that um, it's not it's not a compromise for you to be out there without your children. That's definitely not. But I mean, like, even if my kids don't go out with me, right? Yeah. Let, let, let's let's say let's say that's the case. Um, there's not a one-size-fits-all answer here for this. Um, I believe it starts, though, with everyone. I, I believe it starts with the sighing and crying. If we are truly sighing and crying over this wickedness, we will act eventually. I, I, I'll, I'll tell it like this. Um, you may have heard, you've heard probably hear the story of, Te I say Telemachus. Other people say Te Telemachus. Um, the, the believers in the Roman, in, in the Roman um, times hated the whole gladiatorial battles. They thought it was murderous. And then they had that, had that eventually stopped, by the way, some of you might know how that, how that stopped. It was the believers that began to oppose it. And so there was a discussion about it. Now, what eventually happened was Telemachus, or Telemachus, I say Telemachus, that's why I always say it. Telemachus had had enough. He jumps into the ring and um, separates two gladiators. He, he was a believer that had had enough. So he no more on his watch. So what happens next is uh, everybody said, boo, whatever they, I don't know what the Romans said, boo, you know, but whatever, whatever it was. Their version of boo, right? And then the two gladiators, aren't they suddenly united on one purpose? Can you guess what it was? Kill Telemachus, right? So he didn't do anything, we would say, right? But it wasn't long, that long afterwards that the gladiatorial games were actually outlawed. Now, they didn't, they didn't end exactly when they were outlawed, but they were outlawed, and they were greatly cut back and eventually, eventually quit. So you had these other people that were raising their voices against it. You had him who jumped into the arena at the time. And that's why I say there's not a, a one-size-fits-all thing necessarily. We didn't, it wasn't necessary for everybody to jump into the ring necessarily. Certainly my, my vision or my burden, if you will, is to get us all to the point where we are outraged 
and offended at the wickedness going on and we're not passive. To me, that's, 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 that's a big point to say. I can't tell you in, in terms of every single action. But I will tell you, if we are silent cry over the wickedness, we might as well not be in any place out there anyway. That's where we must, where we must begin. Yes? Um, in your reference to the um, Ezekiel 9. Shoot, can, can you all hear this? <coughs> Ezekiel 9. Speak Yeah. Um, did that literally happen in time and place in the history of Jerusalem, or was that a future, future prophecy? Okay. Yeah. Was that, were those literal people who had six executioners and one man with the marking? Right, with the marking instrument. Um, I believe that was a vision, just like what we see later on in the book of Revelation. I believe there was a vision of what was going to happen to Jerusalem, which we know under the ministry of Jeremiah, Jeremiah that is what happened. What, what Ezekiel was facing there was that some of the Jews had already been taken, um, taken out. Not all of them had. Nebuchadnezzar at that time was like, okay, you guys back in Jerusalem, if you straighten up and just pay me enough money and stay poor, I'll let you alone. And so there were some people that said they're going to come back. And Ezekiel was up against that kind of business. And so he had, to, he, he, he had this vision to point out that if they didn't turn around, the problem really was not Nebuchadnezzar. See, that's what he thought the problem was. If they wouldn't be that stinking Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, we're going to have a pretty nice life around here. And Ezekiel's, his job is, it's not Nebuchadnezzar. It's God you have a problem with. And this is what's going to happen to your city if you don't straighten out. But I'll protect the ones who are concerned about me, and by the way, it's those false prophets and priests that you're trusting in who are going to get it first. And so I don't believe there's this literal thing. I believe there's a picture of what was going to happen shortly thereafter what Nebuchadnezzar was going to do and did do to the entire, um, to, to the city, which I think is, is, is what you have going on in, in the book of Revelation. Anyway, yes, Jen. It's, it's talking about those who grieve and lament over all the detestable things. Is that something that's an outward, outside of your home, or is that something that could be done inside your home as a mother with your children in kind of doing that, raising children to feel that way? Is that normal? Yeah. Certainly, certainly inside your home at a minimum. I mean, I, I don't think we can be dispassionate when we teach our children about wickedness. Like, oh, you know, some people are wicked, some people are not. I don't think we can do that. And the reason why I say that is because the Bible definitely does not do that. Um, there were times when, like, for example, um, we didn't read it, but there was a time when, when God told Ezekiel to stamp his feet and smack his hands together. That sounds kind of like a little overkill. Can't you just tell us? But then you have all these other um, pictures that Ezekiel had to do. For example, he had to cook his food uh, God told him to cook his food with human waste um, as a demonstration of what was going to happen to these folks. You, this is going to be you. And Ezekiel complains about that and says, do I really have to? And God says, okay, you can use cow waste, and which, which, which he does. What I'm saying is, I don't think we can, I don't think we can ever talk about wickedness without, without corresponding emotion, ever. Because we see throughout the scriptures, when we see wickedness, we see emotion, we see it in the New Testament of Christ getting emotional over what's going to happen to Jerusalem. And I, I, I believe we do our, our children a disservice if they're like academic about this. Because I believe we have a pretty much an academic... I, I, I mean, I, 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 I'll mention this again, I know I've mentioned it before. I, I saw a, um, a discussion on YouTube or wherever it was from some folks who really do have a reputation for being all about the gospel, if you will. And they had a discussion about whether abortion should be illegal or not. And their conclusion was, well, hey, wicked people, you know, why, should we, why should we have laws against people who are going to do bad things because that's, that's what they do anyway. I thought, and I, 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 my, my, my head wanted to pop off. You're, you're okay with laws against killing you, But it's dispassionate. It's, it's an academic discussion. No emotion. 
But I don't think the Bible teaches that at all. I saw another, another hand. Yes? This is in response to Walker's question about whether this happened. The, the vision was in, con in the context, too, of God's leaving the sanctuary. His presence had arisen from the cherubs and was now at the threshold. And later on in Ezekiel, God's presence actually leaves the sanctuary altogether, leaves the, the tabernacle. So, or the temple. Um, so I think it's, it's just vision in, in this context in chapter 9. Yeah. It's representative. The broader yeah. context. Yeah. Kind of argues. Yeah. I believe that's the case. Yes, Dave. In, in regards to looping a whale, and, um, uh, two weeks ago I was reading on, on the great book of Jonathan Edwards and the amount of time that people spent in prayer back then um, about a group of ladies who were meeting constantly for prayer um, about how his sermon you know, affected so many people so that soul was in the hands of the name of God yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then and then what became out of that and so sometimes with your weeping and wailing and, and, and all that are we even prepared to do that because of the amount of time that we as citizens of the kingdom spend in prayer? I mean, maybe there's people in this room that, that spend more time than what I do. But can we even expect that when prayer is such a huge aspect of Christianity? Yeah. Um, you know, we read of some of the great men of faith who had wooden floors and there was, you know, Dinges and the wooden floor from their knees. Mm -hmm. sure. We have that in our homes today. Yeah. It's not in my home. You know that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and where does that come into that whole aspect, though? Yeah. A couple things about that. First of all, um, it, the, 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 the spiritual revivals that we see in Scripture, interestingly enough, do not appear to be the result of prayer. Interestingly enough, for example, um, the Moravite revival, for example, um, the revival under Josiah, for example. Now, there may have pe been, been people praying, for sure. It seems to me that there is a, a su supposed to be a, a combination of proclamation and prayer, and it seems to me that you generally speaking see both. And if, and I don't think you can possibly be, be so concerned about the um, wickedness that's going on without the prayer. And so I actually think that's where it actually starts, is, is, is seeing through, with, with the eyes of faith, if you have, or with the eyes of God, the wickedness that's going on. I think that's actually where it begins. And then it, then it goes to prayer. I think you see that exactly in the book of Habakkuk, for example. Habakkuk begins by seeing all the wickedness, and then he starts to pray. And then he got, gets an answer he's not really uh, happy with. But you see that that's the pattern that you see in, in that book. And that book really deals with the very question you're, you're, you're talking about. Look at all this wickedness. What is, go what is going to be done here? Um, a lot more could be said about that. Uh, other questions? Yes. This this subject that Liz brought up about the thin, you know the thin line between you know what you should do, how much you should put yourself out there. I mean, it's that's always a that's a tough su subject for me when I think about it. I mean, because I think about two guys I think about are John Bunyan and David Livingston, who both had families and were both criticized no matter what they did. That David Livingston went out to Africa all by himself. He got ragged for leaving his family at home, not taking care of him, brought his family with him, and a couple of them died from disease, it, it, you know? John Bunyan, all he had to do, his daughter died while he was in prison, all he had to do was get a permit. All he had to do was get a permit, and he could go home. And he chose not to do it, you know? And, and it's, it's really, it's, a, it's just a really tough subject to think about. Um, and those, both of them had a major, major impact for the sacrifices that they made. So the choice that they made was obviously right. 
you know, it was obviously right, right choice to make. It, it seems like William Carey is the same thing. Yeah, William Carey. His first wife died. She's just, look, for her, she just went crazy. And all she had to deal with, it was, it, it, it was unbelievable what she had to deal with, or what, what he dealt with as well. Yeah, and, and I don't really have um, myself necessarily the greatest answers for these kinds of things. I don't really understand why, as I've mentioned before, Paul, wherever he went, somebody got hurt. It seemed like Apollos sort of has the free ride to me. You know, he's kind of comes in the back, and he's doing all the explaining, and he's getting all the credit for being a real eloquent guy. Doesn't seem like he ever got hurt. Um, doesn't look like it anyway. And so I, th these are questions that I don't know the answers to. What, what I would have to say is this, though. Can we, as a Christian community, as a broader Christian community, at least stop dumping on the people who are standing up for righteous, righteousness? Can we at least stop doing that? And say, okay, well, you know what? Maybe I wouldn't be doing that myself. I don't know. But what they're doing is right. And this, is, this has to do with, and I'll just tell the story again. And most of you know that this church ran into some problems. We had a couple of uh, box trucks parked out up here with some really offensive messages. And this church got in trouble with, uh, with, the, with the folks where we, we, uh, you know, who, who went this place to us. They've been very, very good to us. And the offensive most messages were about abortion, were about gun ownership, and, and so forth, right? And I got called to the carpet for it by somebody. Now, you got to think about that for a minute. Why would I be called on the carpet for somebody who has a message that's actually true? you got to think about that. But what was more concerning about that discussion that I had was I asked the person who was calling me on the carpet for this, I asked them. I said, would you be as concerned if there's a rainbow truck out there and there's all about homosexual marriage and relations? Would you be as concerned? And I couldn't get an answer out of it for a while. I kept asking. Finally, I said, well, yeah, I'd be as concerned. But it took me a while to get there. So he was willing to trash his Christian brothers and sisters for saying what's true. And, 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 and on the one hand, and on the other hand, willing to countenance what God says is an abomination. So while we talk in a broad sense about where that line is, at a minimum, can we stop can we stop working with Christian brothers and sisters who are actually standing up and doing something? Uh, that's why I, I, I'd be happy to just get there and we're not. Yes, Seth. Tack on to that. Don't you think that a lot of it also depends on, you know, if we don't have somebody doing something outside of the bounds of Scripture, is there really grounds to oppose them? For instance, I mean, we hear all the time with Paul. At least I have a lot of sermons on if Paul had just listened to the believers who told him not to go to Rome, how much more effective could Paul's ministry have been? How many more years could he have lived? Instead, he went to Rome, even though they warned him. It's in the book of Acts. If you go here, we're not going to see you anymore. And he goes anyways. Was he doing the will of God, or was Paul just being stubborn? Right? Like, there again, I think, you know, as Wes said, Clearly, these people are making the decision that, that the Lord is bringing before them. And is their decision outside of the bounds of Scripture? No. Is it, Clearly one, not. is it one we individually would make? We don't know until we're in that situation. So I think there's wisdom in saying, look, I don't know that I'd make this decision, but it is not outside of the bounds of Scripture. And if they, feel, if they truly feel that they are called to do this, and nobody is feeling a sense of true opposition according to the Spirit. That's the other thing, too. In this goes the whole discernment aspect. The Spirit that bears witness with them better be bearing witness with somebody else. I mean, if they say, hey, you know, we feel like we need to do this, and everybody else in the church is going, well, hold on, that, that doesn't seem right, then I think you have concern. But I, I don't think we go there. I think we rest so much in our own judgment. Uh, and I think we really need to look and say, look, it's not outside the bounds of Scripture. And so, if that is really truly what they feel they're called to do, um, so be it. Yeah, you and I have talked about this before a little bit. Um, during some of those revival times that we mentioned earlier, um, yeah, I remember reading about uh, two young boys. We talked about this, I think. Two, yeah, two, two young missionaries who wanted to be uh, missionaries in some far off place, you know, back when you got on the ship and they never saw you again. And 
you go to Africa, you usually die from, from malaria in about six months anyway. You would you either dead either they killed you or you died from sickness. That's just the way it was. And um, these boys leaving their family, and they were, they were in their late teens, leaving their families. I mean, is that a good thing? And, and their families crying, you know, I mean, we know we'll never, we'll never see you again. And one of the boys says, one of the boys says to everyone there on the shore, he says, well, should not Christ get all that's coming to him? Does, doesn't Christ deserve all that's coming to him? So why would they say, leave your family? Leave your family. You, you, can't, you can't attack him based on the scripture at all. Yes? I have a question about that. So, the apostle, I can't remember which one was saying that it's better to be single than to marry yourself because you can do God's work. When you become married and have a family, does, your, does that shift what you're able to do according to the Bible? Like, should your priority be... Your family, to your family, and to your spouse, or, or is it, can it still continue to be in the missionary field? It doesn't. It doesn't shift. The, qu the question was, if you're married and have a family, does that shift your, your um, ability? I think to serve God. And the, the answer for, for me, at least, is it, it, it's, it shifts in direction, but it doesn't shift in fact. You're just serving God now a different way. You're taking a longer term view of it. Um, uh, I know Rome doesn't let their priest marry. Okay, good. Because we'll have somebody marrying in some place, you don't have a priest in a generation. It's just, it's, it's just a shift in, 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 in service, if you will. It's a longer term view. All right, uh, good questions here this morning. I'm glad, I'm glad we can talk about this because we have to wrestle with this, my friends. We live in a perverse generation. We can't be casual about it. Thanks for your attention.